My name is uh, Hagai Aran. I'm a PhD student at the Technion Electrical Engineering Faculty. And I'm also, uh, I work at uh, NVIDIA Networking as a software architect. I work mainly on uh, offloading networking and application tasks to SmartNICs. So this, is, this talk is kind of related to my work and my PhD, but it mostly comes from my PhD. Um, as we are a small crowd, feel free to interrupt me during the talk with any questions you have. So in this talk, I want to uh, show you how we turn C++ into this, uh, in general, into a logical circuit, but uh, specifically for uh, packet processing applications. And uh, we'll see some uh, design patterns that we found useful to, to do these kind of applications, and uh, also a library we developed for uh, building blocks for components that help uh, implement uh, packet processing applications on FPGAs. And this talk is based on <coughs> this talk is based on a paper that we wrote uh, part of my PhD with others. I'd like to mention uh, my fellow student Lior Zino, uh, Jolt Istvan, who is a researcher from uh, he was from MDR Research at the time. Now he's at IIT University of Copenhagen, and my advisor Mark Zibelstein. So to motivate the work, I'd like to show you a slide. Uh, maybe some of you have uh, seen it uh, many times in the past. Uh, the uh, end of the NARD scaling, the, the problem get of getting more and more uh, uh, CPU performance as we used to get in the past. You can see that uh, in the far past, we used to get uh, exponential increases in single thread performance and CPU frequency year after year. But in the past 15 years or so, the performance benefits are uh, getting much, much smaller. There's slowdown in this process. And uh, to get uh, the performance improvements we want, we need to do something else. And one of the solutions is using accelerators, customizing the uh, device we're using to the task we want to accomplish. Uh, this can be GPUs for graphical or uh, regular workloads. It can be tensor processing units or similar machine learning accelerators. And uh, the focus of this talk is FPGAs. So what are FPGAs? The name stands for Field Programmable Gate Array. And as it uh, suggests, it's uh, an array. You can think of, of it as a sea of uh, logic array, logic gates that uh, you can customize to your needs. The basic element is a lookup table, a LAT, which gets a um, set of binary inputs and uh, returns a, a single bit of output. And uh, the, the output is determined using a lookup table, as the name suggests, uh, that is programmed uh, dynamically into the FPGA. So this allows you to change the functionality of each of these basic elements um, when you program the FPGA. A single FPGA contains uh, several of these loots inside the unit called slice, and the slice can also include other uh, components that are uh, helpful for uh, routing and connecting the different lots together, and also for uh, small memory storage with the flip-flops. And uh, overall, there, there could be hundreds of thousands of such elements in, a, in an FPGA, or even millions. Um, so you could do uh, almost anything with this. You could program it to do any circuit you can think of. Uh, you could even program it to, do, to become a CPU, but that won't be a very efficient use. The, the, the main use we want to, uh, to do with this kind of uh, device is to customize the, the circuit to some specific application. Um, and this works very well with uh, packet processing applications. They, they require high throughput and uh, low latency, and FPGAs uh, can provide that. And they also provide kind of flexibility 
as we can program them in the field when the requirements change or with protocols, uh, new protocols are developed, so we can uh, uh, reuse the, the same system but reprogram it to, uh, to do a different task. And uh, as an example, Microsoft have chosen to use FPGAs as part of their uh, cloud infrastructure, uh, implementing software-defined networking tasks on the FPGA instead of on their CPUs. So how do you program FPGAs? There's a kind of trade-off. Most commonly, people use hardware development languages uh, such as Verilog or VHDL. Uh, these give you a way to nearly directly express the circuit you want to implement in the FPGA, but they uh, can be complex to, to develop. On the other hand, we could use domain-specific languages like P4. Uh, in case you're not familiar with P4, it's a domain-specific language intended for packet processing. It has some elements for... Uh, uh, de describing uh, match and action tables and uh, custom parsers. And there are compilers that compile P4 for FPGAs. Uh, we'll compare to one of these at, at the end. Um, but this talk is about uh, high-level synthesis. Here we use uh, high-level languages such as C++ and turn that into uh, the code, that the, the FPGA program. So you could take a um, high-level description of what you want to do in C, C++, or OpenCL, and the high-level synthesis tool would convert it to RTL, to Verilog, or to VHDL, and then you could use the standard tools to convert that into an FPGA bitstream you can load into your FPGA. There are several advantages of this approach. Uh, first, you could uh, use uh, this high-level code to target different architectures and let the compiler handle the different details, uh, such as the frequency or the, um, uh, the available uh, building blocks within the FPGAs. Um, and uh, you could also use high-level synthesis to do rapid development and rapid simulations. In some cases, running uh, your code as just as regular C++ code on the CPU uh, for simulation purposes, is much faster than doing a uh, cycle-accurate simulation in, uh, in, in an RTL simulator. And finally, we could also use HLS to do uh, design exploration. We can take the single piece of code and try, try it out with different compiler directives that generate different uh, kind of results, uh, different kind of optimization targets. And we can test these out relatively quickly and see uh, which works best. There are several high-level synthesis tools out there, both from FPGA vendors and from uh, computer-aided design companies. Uh, in this talk, I'll focus on Vivado HLS from Xilinx because it matches the FPGA prototype I've used in my uh, PhD work. So there are a couple of downsides to uh, high-level synthesis. Uh, the, uh, the level of support of C++, as you can imagine, is, uh, is limited. There are some constraints. To allow the compiler to generate uh, Verilog, it has to be uh, aware of uh, the code of each function you're calling. So there are no virtual functions allowed. And similarly, for memory management, it, it has to know each uh, variable where it's going to be stored, so there is no dynamic memory uh, allocation. Um, and there is also no point, pointer casting, uh, except for very limited uh, instances. Uh, the tool we've used supports only C++11, that's the 2018 version of Vivado HLS. But uh, I think recent versions uh, have support for C++14, uh, but still with, with these limitations, you, you have to work uh, within these limitations to, to get it to actually compile. And finally, to get good performance from uh, HLS, uh, you need some, uh, you need to uh, have your code comply with some patterns that allow it to get uh, 
the best performance. Otherwise, it might compile, but it would run very slowly in hardware. So in this talk, I'd like to show you some HLS background so we'll have a common understanding of how we, we uh, work with it. Then we'll see the uh, methodology we've seen others use in the past. We, we, I'll call it legacy HLS for doing packet processing with HLS and some of the problems it had uh, preventing code reuse. And then we'll see uh, our work which uh, develops a template library for uh, packet processing elements and uh, the methodology we use to, to do that. And finally, we'll compare the two. So here's a simple example of a function in, uh, we'd like to compile to hardware. So let's say we have this uh, top function, and it calls three other functions, A, B, and C. And as you can see, there are uh, relations, uh, there are dependencies between the, the output of function A and the input to function B, and etc. There's these intermediate values that are passed along between them. And HLS will take our top function and turn it into a hardware module and turn each of these function calls into its own hardware module embedded within this larger module. And if we naively compile that, we'll, uh, it, it will run the code serially just as it would be run on a CPU. Uh, so first it will execute function A, then function B, and then function C. But this doesn't use the hardware we, we uh, synthesized efficiently. We could uh, perhaps start function B earlier. Uh, if we have uh, the outputs from function A begin to uh, be uh, generated earlier, uh, we could uh, start function B right when the first output of function A arrives. And similarly for function C. So HLS, uh, Vivado HLS provides us with this compiler directive, the uh, HLS data flow, and uh, this optimizes the code for this kind of uh, transformation. Uh, this gives us both uh, higher throughput for, uh, for this top unit, because we can now insert a new input to the system every three cycles, when, whenever the function A completes its previous uh, iteration, and it also gives us lower latency because we can complete processing a single invocation of this top function uh, right after here, after five cycles. A similar optimization that HLS provides is the pipeline optimization. Um, here we have a, a simple expression that, uh, uh, that could be written in C++ and it, uh, it would be translated uh, naively to uh, a combinatorial circuit that uh, receives the inputs and uh, computes the result. But we can't change the inputs and enter a new uh, output, uh, enter a new input to this uh, circuit until the data has propagated all the way to the output. And if we want to get higher throughput, uh, we can use the pipeline optimization and have the compiler insert intermediate uh, memory to keep intermediate state between different stages. And then once we complete a single stage, for instance, this multiplication, we can already enter new inputs to the system. Uh, so this gets us a higher throughput. Uh, we pay a little bit in more resources, but we often uh, want to do that to get a better performance. A any questions so far? Okay. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about. Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, we ha the compiler has to be aware of the entire circuit of the function. If if we're applying this optimization to a function. The compiler is aware of the entire function and it has to inline every function call this function makes. This is why we use a combination of the pipeline optimization and the data flow and not just pipeline everything. Uh, yeah. 
So, so the question is how to express uh, the pipeline in C++ code. Yeah, so, so the, the advantage of using uh, HLS rather than uh, uh, HDL uh, language is that the compiler does this for you. You don't uh, uh, specify exactly the length or the uh, um, different uh, computations you want to do in each stage, but instead you specify the entire uh, function, and the compiler uh, uses some model of the underlying hardware, and it can infer how much time it takes to do each of these operations, and then it uh, inserts the registers on its own. I think you you can even tell it you want it to uh, terminate at, uh, uh, at a specific number of cycles, but uh, in most cases I haven't used that. I, I mostly used uh, uh, interfaces with uh, with control signals that allow you to process data whenever it's available, rather than uh, exactly specifying the the cycle number you want. Well, the, the cycles can, can the, the stages can take more than one cycle. It depends on what you do in each stage. And in fact, in, in, in general, you're correct that uh, you can adjust the cycle uh, time according to the circuit that's generated. But uh, specifically in, in this uh, project, I've worked with um, a smart NIC that has a shell provided by uh, the vendor, uh, Mellanox, and they uh, set the, uh, the clock frequency, so I had to work with this frequency. Um, but, but yeah, I think you, you can play with both, and you can, have, uh, you can tell the compiler to generate uh, a pipeline where each uh, stage takes two or three, ci two or three cycles if it uh, results in, in better quality of results. Um, okay, so how have people used HLS for packet processing? There, there are a number of examples uh, uh, published in the past. I'm focusing mostly on uh, uh, Vivado HLS, but also others. Uh, and uh, the way they do that is th they break down the problem into a graph of a fixed element, a data flow uh, graph, uh, which, uh, where each element handles a specific task. And uh, as you can see, the, the code itself, I'll, I'll show you a few examples. It, it looks a little bit like uh, hardware definition languages, but written in, uh, in C++. Um, so uh, as an example, uh, I'll walk through a, a simple UDP firewall that uh, receives uh, uh, packets, UDP packets, extract their headers, the, the necessary fields from the headers uh, um, and passes these along to a hash table, which then uh, selects whether or not uh, the packet should be passed or, or should be dropped. Uh, in such a, an application, you also you would have needed a control gateway to uh, program the hash table to uh, enter inputs into it, but uh, I'm going to ignore this part to simplify the, the uh, example. So we're going to use the data flow optimization so we can process uh, uh, packets in uh, the parser while we're processing the next packet in inside the hash table. And we're also going to break packets into uh, smaller units called fleets. That's both because the uh, interface with the uh, surrounding environment in the FPGA requires this um, uh, this interface, the, uh, breaking down into uh, fixed size units, uh, but also it helps us pipeline the processing. So we can uh, process a single fleet in a pipeline and then uh, process the next one while the pipeline continues with the rest of the, the processing. So to uh, define this in uh, HLS terms, we define a uh, 
uh, or the, the legacy code would, would define a struct of uh, what's included in a fleet. Uh, this co complies with the AXI uh, standard, the AXI stream. And uh, you have the uh, data uh, field, which contains the, the, the bulk of the data of the, this unit. Here it's 256 bits of, uh, of data. And there are also metadata fields like keep, which tells us whether or not there's padding in this unit, in case the, the packet is not a uh, uh, multiple of 256 bits. And the last bit, which tells us uh, whether this is the last fleet inside the packet, so we can turn over and start with the next packet. Uh, the APU int uh, field is uh, arbitrary precision uh, data type provided by Vivado HLS. And then we define, based on this type, uh, an HLS stream type. HLS stream is a template class provided by HLS as well, which uh, the compiler can convert into a FIFO uh, that uh, processes or keeps and uh, transfers this type of uh, data. Now our top function for the firewall would be uh, uh, would include this declaration. Uh, passing the uh, streams uh, by reference tells the compiler that this uh, unit has this uh, uh, FIFO interface uh, as an input or an output. And interestingly, you don't specify the direction, whether you read or write from this FIFO. It's inferred by the compiler according to how you use the actual uh, uh, parameter. If you're calling read, then it's a uh, and input and vice versa. As we mentioned, we're using, we're using the data flow optimization. And to connect the two uh, submodules, we need another uh, stream. So we declare a, an HLS stream here. And unfortunately, it has to be a static variable. This is because uh, the, the runtime model uh, basically reruns this uh, top function over and over again. And the, um, the, this connecting uh, module, and in fact, any state we want to keep has to be uh, stored uh, somewhere. And we said it, it can't be stored on the heap, so we're using a static variable here. Um, and then we invoke the two uh, functions, causing the compiler to instantiate them, and uh, we get the, uh, the desired uh, circuit. Yes? You mean the lookup stream? So uh, the lookup stream is, uh, th this uh, line declares uh, the lookup stream as a FIFO. And passing it to a parser here uh, connects the parser output to this FIFO stream. And uh, similarly, passing it here to the hash table connects it as an input to the hash table. Yeah, yeah, this is done automatically. If you try to read or write twice uh, or something uh, bad like that with the data flow optimization, the compiler detects that and outputs uh, some uh, unreadable error. <laughs> yeah, in general, with, with the FIFO, you could both read, and out fr read from it and write to it. But when, you use, when you're using the data flow optimization, uh, we have to uh, use it only in a single direction. So here's a few lines of code from the parser itself. I'm not going to go over every part of it because it's a little bit long, but just the first parts. So here we're using the pipeline optimization to allow the parser to operate on multiple fleets concurrently. And uh, we define the state, the internal state of the parser, again, as a static variable. Uh, 
we need state to uh, tell us where we are within this packet. Uh, because, uh, uh, as I've said, we, we're breaking the packets apart. Um, we're also using a static variable to keep the results because the results uh, need to be built over time along these different uh, fleets. Um, and then we uh, implement the state machine itself. So, for example, for the first state, this is the first fleet of the packet. We check whether there are inputs available in the input FIFO, and we also have to check whether there's room for the output in the output FIFO. Otherwise, we, we may read something but have no place to store the results, so that would uh, cause us to lose data. And we read the single fleet from the, uh, the input FIFO. And then we can run some code that would extract uh, the uh, necessary fields from the headers and store it. And uh, we update the state machine according to whether this is the last fleet in the uh, packet or not. And uh, if it's the last one, we also uh, would have uh, sent the output to the output FIFO. Um, so as you can see, there are several issues with this kind of code. Um, mainly, the use of static variables makes it very difficult to reuse code. You can't reuse any function that uh, does that more than once. Uh, there's also limited use of C++ classes. Uh, that's un unfortunate. And, and the use of uh, streams makes the code very, um, uh, very verbose. You have to write these uh, checks for input uh, input stream as output streams over and over again. Yeah, yeah, except for maybe the uh, pipeline optimization that's done automatically, it's very close to, uh, to hardware, to hardware description languages. Um, so I'd like to quote uh, Larry Wall, who said that uh, programmers, uh, the greatest programmers have uh, laziness as one of their virtues. And by laziness, of course, we mean uh, uh, focusing on code reuse and uh, task automation to reduce their labor. So we wanted to make the code more usable. And uh, we developed uh, this uh, template library and uh, the uh, accompanying methodology to do that. Uh, the methodology is basically described as uh, we're still using the, the data flow design. Uh, but we're develop developing the basic elements of data flow as a C++ object, rather than a function. And uh, in each uh, C++ object, the uh, state is kept as part of the member variables instead of using the static variables. Um, so we still need the compiler to turn some function into a, um, a hardware module, so each C++ object uh, of this methodology will have a step method that's uh, converted into the hardware module. But we also use other inline methods to, uh, to help in some cases if we either want to break this module apart or if we want to put some of the functionality in other classes. And I'll show uh, an example of that later on. Um, and we still have to use HLS stream in all the interfaces, uh, but we sometimes uh, instantiate the stream as part of the class to reduce the, uh, the number of uh, connections lines the, that we saw before. Uh, that's, uh, that's a little bit verbose. Uh, in addition, we can use templates to uh, create, uh, to make some reusable objects and use function objects to uh, customize them. So this is a little bit tricky. We, because we don't have uh, virtual function support, we can't just pass function pointers or uh, std function. We have to uh, either pass lambdas or uh, function objects to these templates. And uh, have the compiler inline the function into the implementation of the top uh, unit so, so it can convert it to something similar to what we saw before. And finally, as you can uh, imagine, we can also aggregate several uh, objects as a, in a single object to get reusable parts of the graph. Uh, 
So we developed a template library called NTL based on this methodology. It includes some uh, networking related elements, both for uh, processing headers, uh, some common data structures like hash tables and uh, uh, arrays, and uh, a scheduler for, um, for scheduling uh, packets in doing quality of service. Um, and there are also basic elements that are uh, more general. They are used to glue things together when using these uh, elements to, to make an entire application or an entire circuit. I'll focus just on a few of these, the uh, scanfold and programmable FIFO. Uh, but you can find out more information in our paper. So scan and fold, these are common operators. You can find them in uh, functional languages and reactive programming. We adapted them to our purposes so that they operate on streams. And specifically, they reset their state on every packet. So take, for example, a scan operator uh, working with the uh, plus uh, operation. It would uh, accumulate uh, all the inputs it receives here and the outputs the intermediate results. And whenever you receive uh, the end of a packet uh, signal, it would reset its states starting over. And similarly, the fold operator wor works the same way, but only outputs a single output for each packet once the end of packet uh, arrives. So this, uh, these operators allow us to reduce the boilerplate uh, handling of HLS streams. Instead of doing these uh, checks for inputs and outputs all over, we put them as part of the operator, and uh, the, uh, the function objects or lambda that we pass here just ha needs to handle uh, a single piece of uh, data at a time. So here's an example of how you could use fold and scan to build the parser, and simplify it a little bit. Uh, we first uh, build a, an enumerate uh, element. This element takes the input stream, and for each input, it adds an in, a running index as part of a tuple. So this uh, allows us in the next stage to, uh, uh, to know where we are within the packet. We don't have to keep that as an, ex uh, as an internal state. And to implement enumerate itself, we use several blocks. The, the dupe block, which duplicates the input stream into two output streams. Uh, scan uh, to implement a counter. The counter just basically increments the internal counter on each state, resetting its state for every packet. And then we use a zip operator to bind who combine the two uh, uh, streams together and gives us the desired result. Then we use the fold element to implement the, the rest of the parser, where the extract header method uh, that's passed into the fold operator just needs to handle these, uh, these fleets, so it has less state to worry about. Here, here's how it looks in, in code, at least most of it. Uh, we have the parser uh, class. And uh, as I've said, we have the step method, which will turn out uh, into a hardware module. Uh, here we define the output stream as a member rather than as a parameter to, to the function. And this allows us to uh, simplify a code that uses this class. It doesn't have to declare the intermediate uh, streams. The stream is already declared as part of the class. Uh, then we instantiate the submodules we use, the enumerate and the extract method uh, classes. But uh, as you uh, may guess, we, we uh, only declare their state here. This doesn't actually instantiate the hardware module itself, because HL the HLS compiler only does that when we call the function. So we have to call these uh, uh, members step function here and here inside our step function to actually tell the compiler to instantiate them. And finally, we use a, a link uh, call to link the output and the output of the 
last step to the output of this module to uh, keep everything uh, similar so that we always output to the output stream. Um, so using this methodology, uh, we keep all the state as part of these uh, classes or these objects, but we still need to have uh, a static variable in one place, but it's only in the top function converted by HLS to, to the top uh, module. Um, so the, the top function is a very simple wrapper, and that's the only place we need to use static uh, with this change. Um, any questions? Okay. Oh, go ahead. Um, if it's not in, the question is whether this function can contain something not synthesizable. Um, if you do that, then the entire function, the entire module won't be synthesizable. So I, I don't think that's uh, productive, but uh, you can have uh, uh, compiler, uh, sorry, uh, macro uh, definitions uh, to, uh, used to um, to compile the same code with and without synthesis. So you could have sl small differences uh, between the, the two. If you really need uh, to to use uh, unsynthesizable code in, in inside your hierarchy. Um, if we don't use the data flow optimization, we get uh, a more uh, serial execution within the FPGA of, of our code, uh, which is not what we want. Yeah, yeah. You'll get a state machine in Verilog. It's, it's, it, you, you could say it is optimized for something else. It, it might be optimized for... Uh, for area or for uh, something else, but but uh, that's not our goal here. Um. There are many pragmas. I I don't know all of them. <laughs> so here's another thing we used. Uh, another issue we used C plus plus to overcome. Uh, if we if we're using pipelines. We have uh, this uh, code, for example, that checks the output FIFO for room and then does some computation and outputs data to the FIFO. And suppose we want to pipeline this. Uh, there's a problem that there's a dependency between the, uh, uh, this check of the second invocation of our function and the output of the first function. Basically, if we pipeline the code like this, um, we could check here and see that there's room in the FIFO and everything is okay, begin executing, executing our computation. And here, the previous computation would put something in the FIFO and then it's full and when we try to write our own output, uh, we're doomed. So uh, the compiler detects this issue and it moves the, uh, um, the pipeline version of the, the uh, execution uh, later on, so there's no conflict, but this reduces performance. And, and there's no real reason we have to do that. We could have uh, done something else. Instead of checking for a, a single room in the FIFO, we could have checked whether there are, let's say, four uh, empty slots in the FIFO. And then, if we uh, pipeline the, the code this way, uh, even if we if we write all the previous uh, writes into the FIFO, we'll still have room for for our last one. But uh, unfortunately, the HLS compiler doesn't provide us with this ability, and the the FIFOs that it generates, they only have a way to check whether they're full. They don't have a way to check whether there are n empty places. So to overcome this, we developed a wrapper around this FIFO, which keeps track uh, within it 
uh, of how many places, uh, empty places the FIFO has and how many uh, places uh, have been uh, read. Um, we have, uh, we put some of the logic that tracks this uh, information within the producer of the data, so it's part of the producer's pipeline. And we constantly receive updates from the consumer telling the, produ telling the producer that uh, the uh, data has been read. Um, so by, by doing that, we can overcome this problem and we write a replacement uh, class for HLS stream that matches its, uh, its uh, um, um, uh, basically its concept or its, uh, its de de desired function calls. Uh, so we can uh, replace uh, HLS stream with our function whenever, with our um, uh, class, wherever it's necessary. Uh, so this is uh, how it looks like in, uh, in uh, general. Uh, we have a template for a programmable FIFO, which in, in, in addition to the um, uh, template type for the data within the FIFO, it also receives the depth uh, of the FIFO. Um, and we have the same function signatures for writing and uh, reading from the FIFO. And uh, I won't go over the details, but we also have the, uh, the, the state tracking how many, uh, uh, how many uh, instances have been written or read from the FIFO. Um, and we have the uh, internal stream itself. And uh, here we use the compiler directives telling the compiler to inline these functions to the producer or to the consumer of the data so that the internal state here is uh, pulled in to the right place. And, it, and the logic becomes part of the producer pipeline or part of the consumer pipeline. Um, so this is a, a nice way we could use uh, inline methods uh, as part of this methodology. And uh, it, it also, uh, we also used uh, in our um, class library, we try to abstract streams and not use HLS streams specifically, so we can always replace them as needed using templates. So here is a short evaluation of this methodology and uh, legacy work. We compare it to both legacy and also to a P4 example of, of this simple uh, UDP firewall example. And later I'll tell a few words about how we implemented a more complex application with this methodology. In this evaluation, we targeted the uh, Melanoxinova SmartNIC, which includes uh, Xilinx uh, Kintex Alterscale FPGA, and uh, it was running at 216 megahertz. Um, and a quarter, yeah. <laughs> so here's the table that shows the results. We have the th three implementations uh, we compared. Uh, we have the throughput latency and FPGA resources that are used. The, uh, uh, lookup tables, flip-flops, and block runs, and the number of lines of code <laughs> in each uh, implementation. So first, we see that we can reach the desired throughput in every implementation. Uh, our uh, SmartNIC is, has a 40 gigabits per second link, and it, it uh, reaches a maximum of 59 million packets per second and a half. So uh, every implementation was able to uh, surpass that. Uh, but the number of lines of code for the legacy implementation is nearly three times higher than the uh, NTL implementation because of the reduced boilerplate and the reuse of uh, elements. In, in P4, we uh, see that P4 does use less lines of code compared to our code, and that's understandable because the P4 language is intended for these kind of tasks, but uh, the actual implementation uh, did took more uh, area on the FPGA and uh, the latency was higher. Uh, this may improve in the future for uh, if, if um, compilers for P4 to FPGAs become better, 
but uh, there are still advantages to using C++ in that you could uh, write things that are not expressible by the DSL. Yeah. No, I'm, no, I'm afraid I, I haven't tried implementing it, it in uh, HDL. Go ahead. Yeah, the the So the, the question is whether the numbers of LUTs is normalized, but no, the, the, these are the numbers that we got uh, on this specific board, but we implemented the same logic on, uh, on the same board on all three instances, so it's comparable. I, I'm not sure the, why the... Uh, the throughput was higher for uh, SDNet, for P4. I believe that, uh, that it, uh, it tries to uh, satisfy the minimum we specify, but um, I if, it, if it is able to reach higher throughput, it just does that. Yeah, it yeah that, that should be the, the reason. But uh, I think that if, if the uh, compiler was able to uh, optimize for the exact target we specified, it might have been able to, uh, to uh, meet it, meet it clo more closely without wasting resources. Uh, I think that the, the compiler just uh, tried to be above this uh, threshold. Um, but yeah, it, it seems that it does waste uh, area in, in for uh, gaining higher throughput. Um, so to, to look at a more complex example, we implemented a framework for uh, offloading uh, application logic into SmartNix uh, called Nika. And to uh, implement an example application for this framework, we did a cache for key value stores. So the cache um, helps a memcached server that runs on the CPU here. And uh, it, uh, it can uh, keep the most popular items on the SmartNIC instead of on the CPU, or in, in addition to the CPU. And if a get request arrives targeting one of these popular items, it returns the response directly from the FPGA without going through the CPU to reduce uh, the CPU overhead. Um, you can read more about that in our ATC19 paper. Um, we used the NTL library and this methodology to build uh, the key value store cache and the surrounding uh, FPGA infrastructure. And uh, we were able to uh, process 16 byte get requests at 40 million transactions per second. Now this doesn't give you the uh, end performance because it depends on how much data still goes through to the CPU. So for instance, for 75% hit rate, you'd get a nine times improvement over the CPU only implementation. Um, and here's a block diagram of the uh, key value store cache. I, I'm not going to go over all of it. I just wanted to show it so you, you can see we, we've colored the blocks that we were able to reuse in green, uh, either we use them as part of uh, uh, by, by reusing NTL elements or by reusing parts that are common in different parts of the application. So if you have uh, uh, this block here, it, it, it appears also here. We could also reuse it by using this methodology. Um, if you're interested to learn more about these topics, there are a couple of uh, resources here. Uh, you can find our paper from FCCM19. 
there is a nice tutorial from a researcher at uh, ETH about using Vivado HLS for high-performance computing. Uh, I've also used one of their slides in this talk. Um, there's the uh, official uh, guides from Xilinx. And uh, Xilinx, uh, interestingly, also published uh, an official library that does uh, 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 parsing for uh, packet processing and uses metaprogramming and boost MPL to, to implement that. So that's something interesting to look into. Uh, and there's also another paper from FCCM19 called Module Per Object, which uh, describes a similar methodology, uh, although with, with a slightly different focus. Um, so I, I hope I've given you some taste of what it's like to, programming, to program FPGAs with C++. Um, you can find out the source code uh, on GitHub, and I'll be happy to take your questions. Um, we we only used constexpr in very simple locations. For for instance, uh, um, in the programmable FIFO, I haven't shown this, but uh, where's that? Uh, in the programmable FIFO, we used uh, we passed the stream depth here, and we used the constexpr const expression to uh, calculate the uh, the width of the type we need to store for for the updates the uh, update between the producer and the consumer um, I'm not sure uh, maybe I'm missing something but I'm not sure it helps uh, overcoming the missing uh, dynamic allocation parts but maybe uh, we Yeah, it looks like an interesting thing to, to look into. The, the current version, or at least the version I've used here, only supported C++11. But uh, I think as, as the compilers improve, we, we should try that. Uh, yes? Um, one of the problems of what you have uh, shown here is uh, the fact that everything is static. Right? Yeah. Uh, and this makes sense, for example, for a stream of uh, bits, of bit numbers, right? Uh, if I want to work on uh, uh, many uh, data items and transform them into bits or something like that, I might want Um, so if I understand that the question is whether it's possible to use for loops to generate multiple sub-modules, um, for example. Uh, 
Yeah. So, so in, in general, uh, I think the, the most common optimization for loops you, you find in, in the manuals is pipeline. You can pipeline a loop similarly to what we did for a function, and it can process uh, elements uh, concurrently. Um, but you can also unroll a loop. You can, you can, if the compiler knows the, the bounds, uh, the loop bounds statically, you can unroll it and tell it to uh, create all the logic in advance. Um, I did try to play with generating submodules in a loop, and that was a little bit tricky because there's another limitation in HLS, at least in, in this tool, you can't use uh, pointers to pointers. And if you you can generate uh, several classes, several objects in a loop, but let's say if you store them in an array, then how do you address a specific one of them? How do you connect it? Th that's not uh, something you could do without pointers easily. Um, but perhaps uh, with the metaprogramming and const expression in the future, maybe that would become uh, possible. Yeah, yeah. That's an important uh, message that programming hardware, even in C++, is still hardware. Okay, thank you.